We're going to turn to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. And we're going to do verses 18 through 20. Three verses today, the very last three verses of Matthew chapter 28. Jesus has been resurrected. Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. And I noticed that the kids in their Bible fellowship class, they had their verse on their paper that they learned that Jesus disappeared out of everyone's sight as he floated up into the sky. And there's another place in the Bible that says when he returns, he's going to return in the same way that he left. But he's going to descend out of heaven one day, everyone. His foot's going to touch the Mount of Olives. And that will be the beginning of the end for history and mankind as we know it. And the kingdom of Christ for a thousand years on this earth. And then after that, forever and ever on the new heaven and the new earth. It's going to be incredible. But we're going to read these three verses. And then we're going to share a story. <clears throat> Verse 18 of Matthew 28. There we go. And Jesus came and spoke to them, to the disciples, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then the Apostle John adds, Amen. We go back three years, 2021, a man named Mark Middleberg, he wrote a book entitled Contagious Faith. And he, in that book, he shares the story of how he went to church growing up, how he turned to reckless partying when he was in high school. He went off the deep end spiritually. But... At the age of 19, he finally gets it. He finally understands what Jesus meant when he said, you must be born again. He went to church, but he wasn't a believer. He wasn't saved. He was not born again. He had a first birth through his mother, but he never had the second birth by God. Jesus says, every human being that wants to live with God forever has to be born again. Well, that happened when he was 19. But no sooner does he get born again, but he notices a girl that he went to high school with starts coming to the same Bible study he's attending. He says, you know what, I went to high school with that girl. And then, so this is like two months in. And so they're going to these Bible studies and, and they're interacting with each other. And one day, it just so happens, by the way, this is a, I think this is in Michigan, and they're going down, she's walking down in cold weather, snow's coming down and he sees her and he stops her on the street. Her name's Peggy. And as he sees her, he finally works up the courage. He's only been a believer for two months. But he finally works up the courage to ask her if she was a believer. And her response there, as the snow's coming down, she says, you know what? She says, nobody has actually ever told me that I needed this. So think about it. This girl's coming to the Bible studies. She's enjoying them. She's enjoying get, getting to know the other people there. But she said, nobody ever told me I need this. Well, Mark Middleberg tried his best to explain what it meant to be saved, what it meant to be born again, what it meant to be basically absolutely 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. He was doing his best as a two-month-old Christian. But what happened is she realized that she had an appointment that she had to be at. She said, hey, 
I've got to go right now, right in the middle of the conversation. So he doesn't get to the end of the conversation, but she says, can you do me a favor? Can you, can you call me or come by my house later tonight so we can continue this conversation? Now, man, listen, that is a great, great sign. I mean, something's going on in her heart and her mind. So that evening, Middleburg, only two months in as a believer, goes to her house, continues the conversation, and believe it or not, in his own way that only he, you know, listen, again, he didn't know the Bible very well, but you know what? He knew it well enough that he knew what happened to him two months earlier, and he explains it, and she becomes a believer in Jesus that very night. He was able to lead her to Christ. And this is what Middleburg wrote in his book. He said this, everyone. He said... On? Okay, on. There we go. Let me back up. He said, In spite of my inadequacy, the Holy Spirit worked in a powerful way. Peggy's life and eternity changed. I bet they were. I bet they were. And so, isn't that great? He says, You know what? I was doing all that I could to help her understand this, but there is no doubt that the Holy Spirit... And you know what, everybody, I can remember that same thing in my life, except it wasn't two months after I got saved. Let me tell you something. I got saved at the welding factory, and I came home, and that week, the next day, the next two days, the next three days, I remember on Saturday, the whole family's there and having breakfast together, and man, I'm just telling them how great it was to know that you're going to heaven, and they're all like, all my entire family. They didn't say it out loud, but they did later, but there at the table, they're like, uh-oh, Bobby has become a religious, crazy you know, he's insane. He's, oh, no. He's gotten around people, and they've, they've hypnotized them. They've, they've brainwashed them. And I always used to say, my brain needed some washing, man. Let me tell you something. But nonetheless, but you know what? I was just, I remember one night. I was walking, we kind of had a long driveway, and I was walking down my driveway, and a girl was walking across the driveway at that same moment. It was a girl that that had been at just about every party that I had been to in the last two or three years. And uh, I said, Cindy. And she said, ah. And then, man, right away, I started to tell her about what happened in my life. So I can really relate. He went through the same thing I did. High school, the last few years of my high school was a disaster. But then the year after my first year in college, Jesus brought me to himself. This is crazy. You want to hear something amazing about Peggy, this girl he led to the Lord? This is wonderful. Later on, down the road, she meets a great godly man. They get married, and they end up going to uh, Kuala Lumpur, Indonesia. You know, that's where our missionary is at. And they were doing the same kind of work there, and they spent 23 years in Kuala Lumpur. Think about that. Is that not exciting or not? Serving on the mission field, translating God's word into the language of the people in Indonesia. It is fantastic thing that that Middleburg brought up there about Peggy that what happened in these last few decades since he first brought her to Christ. Now Middleburg, in this book, asks you and I, and by the way, I'm using Middleburg's book as a springboard for this entire message this morning, okay? All five major points, they're very short, they're only that long, but all five points are right out of his book, and in fact, what he does in the book, he gives an overview like I'm going to do today, I'm not going into detail, but he gives an overview about different styles of evangelism. And then, after that, each chapter goes in-depth. If you want to learn more about each particular style, you can go down deep. I will say this. When you start reading it, you'll notice right away that he's kind of like a kitchen sink Christian in the sense that what he's talking about getting saved, he's like, I'm not really sure from the Bible which 
all the things that I should be telling a person in order to bring them to Christ, so I'm just going to tell them everything. And he's fairly confused. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not doubting that he's brought people to Christ. I'm not doubting that God's used him. But sometimes the Holy Spirit uses us in spite of some of the things we say rather than because of the things we say. Because let me tell you, like, he... On this page, he's talking about inviting Jesus to be your Lord and leader. In this page, he's talking about putting your faith in Christ for eternal. You know, so like he gets it right sometimes, and he's way off the other time sometimes. But the basic idea of my message today is right on the money. So we're not going to talk about all of the, those issues. In fact, you know what I did? In my Kindle, I went through and with, 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 with red, and I highlighted. I might even write a book review of this and talk about the positive points and just say, oh, and by the way, and go through every one. I could, I've got them all in there, and I'm talking about there must be like 50 or more in red. And I would categorize them and say, these are where this book is weak. But you know what? This book, on the other hand, is very strong, and you're going to see it today. You're going to see that, the good, good side of it. Now, I love what Middleburg says here. He says this. What if our faith were contagious? You know, we know what contagious means. If you get sick and you're contagious, it spreads. He says, what if our faith were contagious? What if instead of quietly clinging to our relationship with Christ and succumbing to the societal sentiment that faith should be private. You know, don't talk about religion and politics when you're around other people. That's a no-no. Hey, who said that? God didn't say that. That God says the opposite. Go. Teach all the nations. Make disciples of them. Baptize them. Talking about boldness there. It's not like, oh, we shouldn't bring this up because people might get embarrassed. Wrong. Now, again, you can be an idiot, you know, and, and do things incorrectly but what I'm saying is this is that God wants us in our own special way to have a boldness in us to have a heart that's saying Lord just about everybody around me doesn't understand salvation doesn't understand what being born again let's continue with his quote with his quote uh, he says we, we succumb to the societal sentiment that our faith should be private. What if we realize that faith is for sharing? The good news is for sharing that Jesus came not for me and you to be the Savior. Or that Jesus came not just for me and you, but to be the Savior of the world. Yeah. And that he wants us to share the good news about him with others. See, that's a great quote in that book. I love that. He's right on the money. So, in our text that we read earlier in Matthew 28, the resurrected Jesus, he's just about ready to ascend into heaven, and he commands his followers to go and make, notice here, I'll put it on the screen, go and make disciples. And of course, I've told you many, many times, disciples is that Greek word that means pupils, learners, Followers, students. It's the idea of, hey, you get them, and you've been taught God's word, and I want you to duplicate that. You know, it kind of goes like this, and this, and this, and this. It spreads out. It starts with one person here, and it goes to two or three others, and then it goes to up, and you get the idea. That's what God is interested in. Make disciples of all the nations. And before we can make, think about it, before you can make people students, disciples of God, before that can happen, you've got to make them children of God. Now, not you. You don't make them children of God. But it's just like in life. Before you can teach your child, they've got to become your child. You have to give birth to a baby. Then you can teach. First, birth. Then, uh, teaching. And teaching discipling and making them a follower of your morals and your character. You can't put 
Discipleship first with an unbeliever. Hey, let me teach you all about God. No, no, no. We start with teaching them, hey, how do you obtain 100% assurance that you'll be with Jesus forever and ever, ever? That's where we start. How do I have the new birth? I already had my first birth. I've been born physically. Now I need to be born again, spiritually. Okay, so birth first, then discipleship. Don't ever put them back. Okay? They don't need to know about perseverance and, you know, uh, uh, this theology and that theology and all these eight million things that can be learned. You need to know the ABCs. Hey, Jesus came. He died for your sins. He paid for them in full. He wants to give you eternal life as an absolutely free gift. You understand that. We've talked about it a million times. Now, believe me, I know that for many believers, dare I say most, sharing the message of eternal life with others seems like an impossible task for you. Okay? But what I'm going to do this morning is to help you to see that being a witness to the people around you is not as impossible as you think it is. You might think right now, oh man, I know what Pastor Bob's going to say, but you know what? I can't do it. It'll never happen. Not in this life. Not in the next. I won't need to do it in the next. <laughs> but you, you know what? If you think that way, you are as wrong as you can be. Maybe you just need to learn what style, kind of how you're wired to do this. Because there's not just one way. Hey, listen, if we all had to be like Billy Graham, oh, da, 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 and you know, you know, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I'm totally different from Billy Graham. I can't be like, okay, that's right. And I'm going to show you from Mark Middleberg's book that there are actually at least five different ways God wires people to do evangelism, okay? So, God's will is for unbelievers to be saved, to believe in Christ for eternal life. He is on a mission. God's on a mission. He's been on that mission since the beginning of time, and he's on that same mission today and tomorrow and for the rest of 2024 until the day he returns. He's on that mission. The question is, he's asking us to join him. See, because he's not down here personally, like when Jesus was on earth. God is not down here personally. He's not walking around, and he's not sharing the good news. He's relying on our lips, our voice. He's relying on our, our lives to share good news. So let's review. This is the new year. Two weeks ago, oops, I wasn't supposed to push that yet. I brought, underlined it. <laughs> okay, so two weeks ago, let's go back. This was uh, December 31st, the day before New Year's. I talked about this. I talked about a great Focus. Okay, so think about a great focus for 2024. Okay, and what I talked about is we should be focusing on Jesus. Remember the psalmist said, I've set the Lord always before my face. All the time, right there. Who's right in front of me? Jesus. Acts chapter 2. I've set the Lord always before my face. And because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Yes, Jesus can be before us, and he could be beside us simultaneously. He's everywhere. He's beneath us. He's within us. He's above us. He's, he's our foundation below us. He's on our left and right side. He's in front of us, and he's, he's everywhere. That's how great it is. So he's our focus, a great focus we talked about. Then, the next week, last week, January 7th, I spoke to you on a great goal. You remember that, a great goal. What is that? Forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before. Okay? Forget about last year's failures and think about this year's goals. Think about following Jesus and focusing on laying up treasures in heaven. And one of the ways we're going to do that is by being good witnesses. Not only focusing on Jesus, 
studying God's word, uh, growing in our in growing in strength, and like, like talks about Jesus, he grew in knowledge and in stature before God and man. We can grow too. We can grow. You can't be on earth long enough. You know, if you're 85, there's still room to grow. There's still things to learn. There's still things to do for God. So, magnifying Jesus, the great goal, um, pressing toward those eternal rewards, pressing toward the mark, that was last Sunday. Today, January 14th, I want to speak to you on this topic. I want to speak to you on the mission. Remember I said God's on a mission? I want to speak to you the, about the mission that God's on and that he has a desire for all of us as his children to be on as well. And this is the title. You saw it for a second there. I want to talk this year about a great mission for 2024. See, you have all these different things, all these this recipe that God wants us to follow, it's not like just two things, salt and pepper. No, no, no. God's got a whole batch of things. Like sometimes Kelly and I make things, and man, you're sitting there, you're getting a quarter spoonful of this, and an eighth of a spoonful of this, and a half a cup of this, and there's like eight or ten things that you're putting in a pot to make something wonder, taste wonderful. Same thing for our Christian lives, and this is just one more one more part of the recipe, this mission God has for you and I. Boy, this is, this is so crucial. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any of these points, maybe at the most five minutes, okay? But these are all different styles of evangelism. So let's bow our heads for a short prayer, and we'll get right into this. Father, use this message in all of our lives, Lord. God, we need to get on fire for you. We, we need to be not ashamed of helping others find you, but in our own special way. Not the way this person does it or that person. How do I do it? Lord, help us. Use this in the lives of your people. In your name we ask these things, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, most of you have heard of the Las Vegas magicians Penn and Teller. Okay? Uh... On a YouTube video, Penn Gillette, there on the left, his first name is Penn, Penn Gillette, who, by the way, is an outspoken atheist. I'm not saying he's, uh, he's like incorrigible. I'm just saying he just says, hey, listen, I'm an atheist, and I don't believe in God. I, don't, I think religion's bad, and so on. Okay, he's outspoken. But on a YouTube video, he tells this story about a believer in Christ who, after one of his shows in Las Vegas, he was bold enough to approach the six foot seven Penn Gillette magician. He approaches him and he brings a little Gideon's Bible to him. This is backstage and he's signing autographs. That man gets to see him and he looks him in the eye. Well, you know what? Rather than me tell you the story, I said, you know, Robert, let's put this in. So I went ahead and just downloaded the YouTube video here. And so we're going to watch uh, this by Penn Gillette. It'll take about four or five minutes, but it's life-changing. I want you to hear what this atheist says about this believer who approached him with a little Gideon's New Testament. I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I get home from the show. And at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we, uh, we talk to folks and, you know, sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the, um, what I call the hover position after I was all done. Big guy, probably about my age. Big guy. And um, he had been the... Um, the guy who has uh, picks the joke during our psychic comedian section of the show. Uh, so he had the props from that in his hand because we give those away. He had the you know, the joke book and the and the envelope and the paper and stuff. If you haven't seen the live show, uh, it's not worth explaining. But he had props from the show that we'd given him from the night before. Uh, he wasn't the guy that night, and he walked over to me and he said. Um, I was here last night at the show, 
and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition. Um, I thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. A little book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, proselytizing. And then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. And uh, it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. That is an amazing video. It's only a few minutes long, but Penn Jillette, a self-proclaimed atheist, he declares this. He declares, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize them? I put witness. How much do you have to hate somebody not to witness them? That's an atheist talking, everybody. That's not... A, a born again, dedicated, conservative teacher of God's word or preacher. That's an atheist. He's just saying, look, I don't believe in God. But if I did, like you do, and I believe that eternal life was possible through the good news of Jesus, I wouldn't be sitting back. Because what you believe is that people that don't know the truth, they end up in hell. People that aren't born again, they go to hell. Your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, your parents, your children, your grandchildren. He says, how much do you have to hate somebody not to witness to them? 
Now that is convicting. That is convicting. So let me ask you this. How do we break out of this mindset prison that we've gotten ourselves into? How do we break out of this prison of thinking that it's impossible for you and I to do that? That it's just too embarrassing. It's just too socially awkward to talk to somebody about Jesus. Well, in Mark Middleburg's book that I referred to earlier, got those five evangelism styles. Now, let me just say this. When I looked at them, I actually say, hey, you know what? I'm, I think I'm a, I actually do two or three of these at least, and maybe sometimes I do all of them. <laughs> Not at the same time, but with different people, I use different styles. But I will agree that generally, we are wired personality-wise to lean more toward over toward this style than the one over here. Like there's one of them that's like, man, walk up to a person. Hey, you know, I think, Kelly, I thought of your dad. He goes on, he, when he was alive, he would go on cruises and he'd put on this T-shirt and it says on it in giant letters, I am a priest. <laughs> Black T-shirt with white letters, I am a priest. So all these people on this cruise are saying, oh, look, there's a, there's a holy Catholic priest over there. Well, of course, they're going to go up to him and say, Father, so glad to have you. And he says, yeah, I've got some amazing things to tell you. And he'll just start whistling. He went, he'd win tons of people on these cruises. They're out there to have fun and spend money. And he's sitting there giving them the gospel just like that. He didn't, have, he didn't say, hey, can I buy you lunch? Nope, he wasn't planning on... You know, sometimes one of these styles has to do with fellowship and things. But you know what? Everybody's wired differently. So let's start with the first one. Let's go through these, okay? No more than... Shouldn't be more than five minutes on each point, sometimes a lot less. Okay, what if you're a friendship builder? What if you're outgoing? What if you find it easy to make friends with people? Well... You may hit it off with others very easily and enjoy like getting coffee. Here's two ladies having coffee. Okay? You love that. And you know what? You can use that as a springboard. You know, Kelly and I, in the last year or so, maybe a year and a half, we got to go out to eat with a couple. And you know what? We, we just interacted with this couple. They lived way up in McKinney. And we loved this couple. We just so enjoyed being with them. They were our age, and we had a great time interacting. And uh, this man was an engineer. I have an engineering background, and so we got along great. But you know what? The very first time that we, that we had dinner together, man, I just, I just started going in. You know, they, hey, Bob. What, what are you talking on your dissertation about, on your Ph.D. dissertation? Oh, glad you asked, you know. And you know what? For two hours, we sat there and traded questions, answers, and back and forth. And you know what? They couldn't get enough. We were talking out. We were out walking to the car. We are talking in the parking lot. Then the next time we get together, we're talking some more. We're, we had dinner. We're walking around. I forgot where we were at, Kelly. And there's all these things all around us that... You know, lights and things. But we're sitting there on the bench and talking again, sharing the good news. And, you know, I give them a, you can be sure, give them a living water. Hey, read the Gospel of John. Highlight Jesus' promise. See what you think about Jesus' promises. You know what? Friendship building is a great way. Listen, you can always, somehow, some way, get to the place where you can say, Hey, you know what? We've been meeting for coffee for a while now. I yeah, just was curious. You know, something I never asked you about. You know, I grew up, I grew up in church, but I didn't really understand what was going on. And I didn't understand about heaven and hell and that kind of stuff. But finally, I came to understand how I can live with Jesus forever and ever. Do you know that you're going to live with Jesus forever and ever? Boom. See. Maybe you're just wired this way. You're outgoing. You don't have any trouble talking to people. You're an extrovert, not an introvert. Okay? Okay. So, Middleburg says this is a great approach to use with people who will never come to church. You know, you've invited your neighbor and invited your neighbor and invited... They won't come. 
They won't come. They had something bad happen to them way back here. And they said, I'm never going in the doors of a church again. He says, this is a great way. Because you know what? People love to get together. Talk. Talk about the cowboys. Talk about food. Talk about movies. Talk about, you know, talk, talk. Have fun. Have fellowship. But you're on a mission. You're on a mission for I'm going to use this because God is going to open a door. Just the right moment, just the right day, just the right time, it's going to happen. I'm going to trust God for that. And you know what? This is a great way. Now, real quickly, I'm going to try to give an example of each of these in the Bible. And in the Bible, well, there's Matthew from the Chosen series that we've all watched, most of us. And in Mark 2, it talks about that he had... Other tax collectors and friends and rowdy people over to his big fancy house. And he invited Jesus as well. And you know what? He was, he was this way in the sense of, hey, let's get together. Have some friendship here. Let's rub shoulders with this one who claims to be the Messiah. Okay? This is a great opportunity for friendship building and facilitating a witness for Christ. That's number one. Friendship building. Maybe you're wired that way. Or maybe you know what you love to do? Maybe you love to fix things. Maybe you love to clean things. Maybe you, you don't want to really talk that much. You want to do something for your neighbors, for a family member. And you just, out of the goodness of your heart, you just do it. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine. Your light. What is that? Your good deeds. Let your good deeds shine before men that they may see your good works. Okay? Well, your light is your, your life, your heart for God, everything. The light you beam to other people. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. How are they going to glorify God if they don't know Him? They're going to glorify Him by understanding the truth of the gospel and getting saved, okay? Maybe you love to help people in need. Look at that. Look at that screen. Maybe you just love doing that, okay? You find joy in serving. When you meet people's needs, you show them that they are valuable to you, that they matter to you. And once again, you know what? Through this, you may win their trust. Hey, did you see the impact that man had on Penn Gillette? You see that? Here's an outspoken atheist, and he's then like, and again, of course, the Holy Spirit was resting on that man because he said, he's looking me in the eyes. And, and by the way, when I got saved, I can testify to this guy. I told you the fact I was looking through that crack in the door out at the, all the men that were believers on my, at my factory, about 90 men. And they're eating lunch together out there at 8.30 at night for a half an hour. And one guy would get up and preach. But before he'd preach, they would all eat lunch together and they would sing. And I remember them singing Amazing Grace. No instruments, no guitars, no organ, no nothing. Just a bunch of guys who couldn't sing. And I'm looking through the crack in the door and I'm looking at their eyes. And I didn't, again, I didn't see them like this. Amazing No, they're like. And they're glowing. Same thing. I'm sure that's what was happening. This man is standing before Penn Jillette just glowing with God. And when I saw that, I, you know, the Holy Spirit got up on my right shoulder. <laughs> got the guy behind me cussing and dropping F-bombs because of them singing. And I'm looking at them, and I'm seeing their faces glowing. And I'm, the Holy Spirit's like, Bob, you got what the guy behind you has. You don't have what they have. I got saved within seven days of that night. God can use, you know what? You, you just do these little things and let God, the Holy Spirit, work through you to do the great things. Without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. And we can't lead anybody to Jesus. The Spirit of God's got to work through us. Same thing for our church. Our church can't do anything for God's kingdom unless God, the Holy Spirit, comes down and fills us and uses us this year. In the book of Acts, the, word, the woman named Tabitha was full of good works. 
charitable deeds. She just did them. She didn't ask for money. She Apparently she was a seamstress or something like that. She was sewing all kinds of things and giving them to people. Hey, you need some clothing? Oh, yes. Thank you, thank you. And everybody loved this woman, and then she died. Guess what? Everybody around her loved her so much. You know what they did? They, they went to Peter and said, Peter, get over here right now. We want you to raise Tabitha from the dead. And at that time, the apostles, they had the ability. Jesus said, you will raise people from the dead. They could raise people from the dead at will. They had that power. They had that authority. Remember Peter? He, he had a special blessing from God where he walked down the street in just his shadow. He didn't even have to touch people. His shadow would fall on people laying there that had broken legs and twisted ankles and everything under the sun. You know, pneumonia, you name it. They're laying there and they're all standing up and looking at one another and grabbing one another and hugging and yelling praises to God. So she was raised from the dead by Peter. And Acts chapter 9 says this. It tells us that Tabitha's resurrection resulted in many people in Joppa believing in Jesus. God used her in life. He allowed her to die. And he used her resurrection to bring many people to Jesus. That's amazing. So, selfless sharing. Selfless service. Maybe that's the way you're wired more than any other way. Maybe you're a friendship builder. Maybe you just want to help people. And then, when your neighbor says, you know what? I have hardly met a person like you. What gives? And your, their heart gets softened. And they become open. And man, then God opens a big door for you. And says, you know, I don't say much about it, but Jesus told me I needed eternal life, that I wasn't heading to heaven when I died. I was heading to hell. And I learned that Jesus paid for my eternal life on the cross. He bought me the gift of eternal life. And just by receiving his gift of life that lasts forever, a gift that never ends, whoo! You don't have to be a theologian. All you got to do is be in love with Jesus and let the Spirit flow through you. And even a person that really is just a fix-it person just likes to help in whatever way they can, you can be a witness for Jesus. How about number three? Ah, I personally, I love this style, and you know this because you've heard my testimony nine million times about how I got saved at the factory. You heard it again this morning. The story of how God gave me a job at the right place, at the right time, and he brought me to himself at a welding factory in South Chicago. It's easy for me to share. And you know what? Maybe you have a testimony like that. Now, sometimes people's testimony aren't real flowery. They just say, well, you know, I was eight years old, and I was at vacation Bible school, and I heard the sermon, and I realized I wasn't saved, and... and Right while they were teaching, I put my faith in Jesus. I believed in him for his gift of everlasting life. And I went home and I told my mom and dad, Hey, mom, dad, I'm going to heaven when I die. I learned how to go to heaven when you die today. Okay, maybe that's yours. But you know, even that you could share. But you know, if you're wired this way, you know, for instance... Sometimes people, some people just like to talk about everything. They like to talk about sports. Hey, do you think Dak Prescott is going to get the MVP in the NFL this year? What do you think about that? And they interact and they go back and forth. Hey, what do you think about? And they love to talk about things. They like to talk about politics. They love to talk about sports. They love to talk about the economy. They love, they talk about all these things. Okay. They'll show, they'll, okay, for instance, you might like to, oh, did I ever tell you the time when we went to Disney World and we got stuck in It's a Small, Small World for three hours? Did I ever tell you that? You love to tell stories. Well, maybe this is your strength. And you know, this was the Apostle Paul, okay? In chapter 9, Luke tells us how Paul came to Jesus. The bright light from heaven shone. He was on the horse, and the bright light shines. Saul, Saul, he hears the voice from heaven. Why are you persecuting me, Saul? Who are you, sir? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. 
Now, was he persecuting Jesus? Yes, because he was persecuting his word and his people. So he was, in a roundabout way, persecuting Jesus as well. When you get to Acts chapter 22, what's he doing? He's telling that story. He's telling that story. The very same story that Luke told in Acts 9. Then you get to chapter 26. He's with King Agrippa. He's telling the same story again. Paul loved to tell his testimony. I was on the way to Damascus. Bright light shone. He had a story to tell. So maybe you're wired that way, everybody. And by the way, like I said earlier, um, always keep in mind that depending on who you are speaking to and the circumstances, you may want to kind of use a, a different style with people. Like you may not have a lot of time to build a friendship. You're on an airplane. Now you can build a friendship for 15, 20 minutes. But if you're going to share the, go uh, the gospel with somebody on an airplane, you can't say, well, hey, after we're done, do you want to stop for, you know, you, no, you can't do that. So you know what? You've got to interact with them. And then they say, you know what? For 30 years now, uh, I've been going to church and I've, and you get the idea. And you begin to interact with them. You might have to use a different one. Maybe it's not your exact style, but you just have to do it. That's fine. I'm not saying you have only one way of doing this. That's the only way you can do it. No, you could actually do all five of these. Now, some of them take a little more oomph. Like one of them I'm going to share. It's the next one. You're going to have to have some studying under your belt to do this one. And uh, this is one of the things I got my doctorate in called apologetics, which means defending what you believe. Defending the New Testament, the historic New Testament faith. How do you do that? How do you defend it? Okay, this is the next style. Reason giving. Okay, see there? You got a skeptic sitting there. Okay, and he's interacting. He's sitting there. He's skeptical. He's listening. Okay, hey, uh, why? How, how do you know what you're saying is true? You get the idea. They're skeptical. So you've got to give reasons. And that's what Peter said. First Peter chapter 3. Even if you should suffer. You know, these people were being persecuted because they were standing for Jesus. They were doing what I'm talking to you today about. They were doing it. And they're like, hey, Peter, this is no fun. Man, these people are mocking us. They're humiliating us. They're yelling at us. They're getting persecuted. Peter says, listen, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Don't be afraid of their thing. Don't be disturbed. Don't be troubled. Sanctify, but do this. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Sanctify him. Let him be numero uno. This is like, honor him. You're getting persecuted. Honor Jesus in your persecution. Honor him. Make him say, Lord, even though I'm suffering, I'm not going to stop doing what you put me on a mission to do with you. Sanctify him in your heart. And what else? Always, always, always be ready to give a defense. That's the Greek word uh, where we get the word apolo apologetics from. Okay? Alagia. Alagia, where we get defend, give an answer, give a defense to everyone. Everyone. Hey, how are you going to do that if you're not ready? So this one, you know, if you're wired to be like somebody that loves preparing, getting ready, hey, you know what? I'm going to prepare it so somebody asks me, how do you know there's a God? I can answer that. I'm going to prepare so if somebody says, hey, how do you know the Bible's true? You want me to believe in the man, but the man's in the book. I don't believe the book, so I can't believe the man. You've got to be prepared to make, give answers. And it's not as hard as you think it is. Uh, you have to be ready to give an answer, a defense to everyone who asks you a reason. Notice, for the hope that is in you. They're seeing something in you. You're different. They're saying, hey, everything's falling apart around us. How in the world can you have such a good attitude? You say, well, many reasons. 
Want me to share some with you? Okay. And then I love what he says at the end here. You're being persecuted by these people. Do it with meekness, humility, quietness. Jet, and really, it's a Greek word, protest, that means gentleness. With gentleness and respect. You know, like if you fear God, you respect God. He is the almighty God. I fear God. I respect You respect that person you're talking about. They have an eternal soul, so you need to be gentle and respectful, even though they're hammering you sometimes. Remember, remember what Penn Gillette said? He looked me and that's a good man. That's a good man. Wow. Man. Do you hunger for that? Do you hunger for somebody to say that about you? I do. I do. So first of all, God wants all of his children to, to be able to defend what they believe. Let me give you, we've already given some. Okay? How do you know what you're saying is true? Or, somebody says, isn't it judgmental to say you're right, that Jesus is the only way, and everybody else is wrong? How do you defend that? Because we say that. Jesus didn't say, I am a way, a truth, and a life. No, he said, I am the way to God. I am the truth. And I am eternal life. No one, no one, no one comes to the Father but by me. You've got to be able to defend that. Or if another person says, I don't believe the words of Jesus, the Bible's full of errors and mistakes. And you know what? Sometimes they want to know that an-, an answer to that before they'll let you, you know, before they'll trust you to tell them the most important thing. Yeah, I'd like to believe Jesus' promises, but I don't believe the Bible. I believe it's full of mistakes. You can say, no, it's not, and I'll show you why. You can give an answer, a defense, okay? So God says to all of us, we are to be ready to defend it, you know, and... Listen, he says this, this to us even if we're not debaters by nature. Like, some people, I'll get for you, for instance, you know, I think that someone in our church that fits into this very well is Trent, Trent Muller, okay? Trent has studied, and he's researched, and you know what? Somebody comes to him and says, you know, I really don't, I think the Bible's full of mistakes. Oh, let me tell you seven reasons why that can't possibly be true. Now, if you're a skeptic, you're going to say, great, because I need reasons. Don't just tell me stories. Give me reasons. There's a lot of people in the world there. Intellectually inclined, and they, you know, I had to do this with my, with my nephew. Okay? My nephew called me, and he told me, hey, don't ever talk to my mom and dad about Jesus, and leave them alone. So I started talking to him. And I started sharing uh, the ontological and the teleological arguments for God. Okay? And because this guy was intellectual, smart. And so he gets done, and you know what? He can't respond. He's like, uh, uh, uh. Because I'm giving him reasons and he has no, he, he cannot, he cannot answer back and say, well, that's not true because, he couldn't do it. He just says, well, well, you know all those things, and I don't understand all those things, but, see, but we've got to be ready to give a reason, okay? So, it's important to understand that God has wired some believers to love doing evangelism this way. They don't get flustered with a barrage of questions. They study diligently. Some people just love to debate ideas. Okay? If you like to debate everyday general topics, it's very possible you could do this spiritually. So right now, maybe you are a debater. Maybe if you like to give reasons about things you believe in, not about spiritual things per se, but about life, guess what? You can study and get your spiritual gun loaded. You can say, hey, I can do this, okay? I can remove the roadblocks that are making them skeptical, skeptical about God. Paul used this method as well because he's in Athens, Greece. He's on Mars Hill in Athens, and he's talking to the philosophers there in Acts 17. And man, does he unload 
his philosophical gun on them. And he starts talking. Uh, he says to them, hey, listen, I was looking at all of the altars you have all over the place out here to these idols, and I saw one of them set on it to an unknown God. Guess what? I know who the unknown God is. He's the one that gave life and breath to all there is. He created all things. He gives life to all things. And in him we live and we move and we have our being, our existence. It's because of him. And he goes into all these things and he starts quoting their prophets. He starts quoting like uh, uh, Epimenides and uh, Arturus, I believe, is the other one. Maybe I don't have that exactly correct, but he's quoting their prophets. Wow. Going into their poetry and saying, hey, you believe this, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Guess what? Some of them didn't want to listen. He said, some of them says, we're going to hear you again. Come back. We'll listen to you some more. Others believed Paul, and they were, they were saved. Paul was knowledgeable. He was logical. He was confident. And what he did here in Athens was a perfect fit for the way God wired him. God had made him that way. So, and you know what? We all, even if you're not a debater, you all have to know why you believe what you believe. You don't have to have the really highfalutin arguments that some people may require, but you should have the basic ones. Here's why God's word is without mistakes. Here's why you can trust the promises of Jesus and so forth. Okay, final one, and then we'll, we'll be done, is truth-telling. Now, this is very similar. But this is what I was telling you about Kelly's dad earlier. He was a truth-teller. He didn't need a lot of lead in it. You know what? He could, he could approach somebody, and in 15 seconds, he can make a joke or something, and then boom, he's in the gospel with them. And sometimes you need that. And you know what? God used him. God used him. God used him for 60 years. For 60 years. You know, he just said, man, I'm just a cornbread and beans miner from Kentucky. I don't, have a, I don't have an education. <laughs> I don't have a college degree. And yet God used him to start tons of Bible colleges, tons of churches all over the earth. Amazing. Amazing. So if you're bold, if you're confident, and you want to zero in, you, don't, you, don't, you want to cut to the quick. You want to zero in quickly on what you need to tell this person. Okay, here's the issue. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of introduction. I'm not going to try to tell you stories or anything like that. Hey, I just want you to know where I am I'm at and where I want you to be. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, now some people will chafe at that. But you know what? God's wired people this way for a reason. And if they're following God and listening to God and praying to God, I think God's just going to lead them to people that need to hear this kind of Christian. A truth-telling Christian, okay? Uh, maybe you like to figure out problems. Maybe you like to set a course of action. Maybe you like to make a difference. Then you're a truth-teller, okay? You're a person who's a change agent. You're focused on accomplishing goals. The Apostle Peter is an example of this style. In Acts chapter 2, after being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, he preaches to 3,000 people. Man, he gets right to the, he gets cuts right to the quick. Boom, boom, boom. He's telling them about, and same thing for Stephen, really, in chapter 7 of Acts. Oh, my goodness. He gives you a history of the Old Testament, and then he tells them, you're wicked. You did to Jesus what you did to all the prophets in the Old Testament. You're no different from your ancestors. And, of course, they stoned him to death. But you remember in Acts seven fifty six, I think it is, and he said, behold, I see the heavens open." and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Wow. Wow. God was given a vision just before he passed. Hands of Jesus. The Bible says after Peter's sermon, they were cut to the heart. He got right down to brass tacks and says, you're wicked, you took with your wicked hands, and you crucified the Messiah. They were cut to the heart and they looked at one. Men and brethren, what do we do now? They were already, they already believed Peter's message. They were born again. But they looked at one another and said, now what do we do? We're guilty of killing the Messiah. What do we do? Starts talking to him. To do. 
So if you're bold, you have no problem with sharing your views about everyday matters, you can start doing that about spiritual matters. See, whatever way you're wired, you know, you're wired to be a friend, well, be a friend. But then be a friend about sharing the gospel. If you're, uh, if you're a, a reason giver, okay, all right? Hey, start reasoning with them about, hey, what do you think about the weather? You think it's going to, you think we're going to get any, go back and forth with them about things and reason with them. Well, why do you think that? Why do you think that's going to happen? Why do you think this is going to happen in the election? And here's why I think it. And you hear a debater do that, but then say, hey, there's another thing I want to talk to you about. See, these are wonderful, wonderful styles. You know, this, this is just... I would say, like, when we're looking at this from the angle of personality, we all have different love languages. How do you like to show love? How do you like to receive love? Okay? Some people don't like being hugged because that's not their love language. In the Blondie comic strip yesterday, I thought it was funny. Blondie's sitting in bed next to Dagwood, and she leans over and she says, Oh, this, this novel is steamy. And uh, he says, oh, really? He said, well, what's up? And she said, oh, the, the man in the novel started doing the dishes and doing some vacuuming around the house. <laughs> I thought that was great, you know, that, that that was the steaminess of the novel that this woman is like, woo! <laughs> so anyway, let's close. How many of you know what evangelism style is your best fit? Could anybody raise their hand and say, I think I know what mine is. Okay, good. Two. Two of you. Okay, that's great. Okay. How many of you think you know what your style is? You think you know? Okay, good. I see, I see 2.7 more. No, I'm just kidding. That's okay. Okay. Because you know what? You're probably introverted and you don't do hand raising. Okay, I got you. So, I love this story. I've told you this a million times. One time, the great D.L. Moody in the 1800s, the evangelist, he preached on evangelism, how to do evangelism. And a woman came to him after, you know, the sermon was over like they do so often. And she went up to Mr. Moody, introduced herself, and she said, Mr. Moody, I don't like the way you do evangelism. Oh, is that right? He says, he says, can I ask you a question? He says, how do you do evangelism yourself? Uh, I don't. And he says, oh, okay. He says, well, you know what? I like my way of doing evangelism better than your way of not doing it. That's, that's a good story. So God's inviting you and I to follow him more seriously than ever this year. Folks, we are getting close to the return of Jesus. I don't know if we're days, weeks, months, years, or decades away. But, man, what's going on in the world, what's going on with Israel, I mean, it could be very, very, very close, closer than we know. And we still have family members. We still have neighbors. We still have friends. We still have people we know, let alone the people we don't know, that need us. They need us, and we need to set aside a little bit of time and to be ready always to share our faith, give a defense. We've got to be ready. We've got to be sharpening the axe this year. This is serious. God says to us, he didn't say, hey, would you all think about going and making disciples? Would you think about that? He didn't say that. He said, Jesus appeared, and he says, Go! That's a command. I was thinking of the church lady. What does she say, the church lady? Never mind. Okay. That's a command. Okay? That's a command. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them. Teach them everything that you're commanded to do. And never forget, on this mission, I'm giving you I am with you always, even till the end of the age. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be there with you. You can't do it on your own. You need me flowing through you. I'll do amazing things in 2024 if you'll let me. 
But if you're just going to sit back and say, oh, no, that's for the pastor Bob to do. He's got a great story. Let him take it. No. God's got people for you to reach. Yes, every single one of you here can reach people for Jesus in your own special way. And so what he'd like to know is if you would be willing to go on this mission, to obey him and to join him. If you've not been telling others about Jesus, would you be willing to confess that to God and come to him for the strength and boldness to honor him in this way? Go to God and say, Lord, I've let you down. Lord, I'm forgetting about that this year. I'm going forward. I'm pressing toward the mark. Somehow, some way, every day I'm going to start praying. Lord, give me an opportunity today. Just bring somebody across my path. And then, boom, let me realize, wow, God's opening a door here for me. You can do it. Christian, you can do it. Listen, listen. Man, God saved me out of the gutter, okay? Then I was an alcoholic, and, and I, was, I was a, a dope head. And I love Psalm 40. He picked me up out of the horrible pit, out of the slimy clay. He set my feet upon a rock, and he established my paths, and he's put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. Many shall see it and will fear and will trust in God. My father-in-law said, from the coal mine to the gold mine, just a simple cornbread and beans miner in the coal mines of Kentucky. God raises him up. He used to just talk all the time. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't do anything. We got to have the Spirit. I get up 4 o'clock in the morning. I ask God every day. And he did. No wonder he did what he did. So what would God do through you and I and this church in 2024 if all of us prayed fervently for him to use us to bring people to Jesus? Let's bow our heads. Father, praise you for your word. We praise you for all these different people in the Bible who have their own special way. And Lord, we have our own special way. Maybe our witness is to bake somebody a cherry pie and take it over to their house and say, hey, I know you've been going through some tough times. I just wanted you to know I was thinking for you and praying for you. Here, enjoy. Father, send people our way this year, Lord. Give us courage. Help us to be like David before Goliath and to say, hey, I can do this with God. God, help me to kill a lion. God, help me to kill a bear. What's this big oaf in front of me? Lord, we can do great things. We can kill the giants. We would never think that we could kill, Lord. We can do this, but we're going to have to lean heavily on you. God, I pray before this year is over, I pray that every single person in this room will become a witness and will witness to people this year. And I pray that every one of us can lead somebody to you. And I pray that every one of us can see somebody baptized this year in this church. And I pray that every one of us could have somebody coming to church that we are discipling, that we're making into learners, students of Jesus. Lord, help us. Oh, Lord, help us. We are weak. You, strong. Give us courage. Give us boldness. And Lord, let us use the way you've wired us to your honor and glory on this mission in 2024. And we pray all these things, Jesus, through your mighty name and for your sake. And all of God's people said...